Welcome and thank you for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm Daniel Davis. On the program today, we're bringing leading specialist in what is known as the myofascial release therapy. She's going to be explaining about the light conducting nature of what is known as fascia and what that means for people and how it impacts their emotional and physical well-being. We'll also learn how diminished light conduction can spur problems that someone might not even be aware of and understand the process of myofascial release differs from massage and how it can be combined with movement instruction to correct dysfunctional body mechanics. Her newest book is Touching the Light. It's how to free your fiber optic fascia. And I'd like to welcome to the Beyond 50 radio program today our guest, Ronell Wood. Ronell, thank you for being here on the program with us today. Thank you for having me. Now, is this a process or a discovery that you made on your own here? Oh, certainly not. I am a myofascial release therapist, and the information that I pro- provide in the book was collected through other people's work and scientific research to uh, corroborate some of the things that we found when we were working with people and then went back to explain. Now, how did all this uh, get discovered? I mean, this is interesting, fiber optic fascia. What exactly is that? With an understanding of fascia, we can then begin to describe its mechanism. Many people do not realize what fascia is, and so I'll start with a description. It is the connective tissue in your body that prior to now, doctors have always regarded as packing material, just something that holds everything together. And that is how they proceed when they do surgery without realizing the other aspects of fascia that are very important and can have far-reaching implications once it's been cut or torn uh, years down the road. We know now that fascia is not just connecting everything. It also has a protective nature. It is in your body everywhere. And the very best explanation that I can give to help you visualize how you're put together is to imagine an orange without its peel. It has all of that white pith around it that holds its shape. And we are like that. Just underneath our skin is a superficial layer of fascia that surrounds and connects everything. But you can also take a section out of the orange. And in the same way, you can take muscles and organs out of our body, and they are all individually wrapped in fascia. But think about this. You could also open a section of the orange and see that each tiny little piece of pulp is also individually wrapped, just like we are, all the way down to muscle spindle and organelle, all the way down to bone, and bone is just mineralized fascia. And all of these pieces are connected to each other. It is the only mechanism inside you that contacts everything else inside you. So its role is very important for your overall health. And the final thing that we discovered was that uh, the fascia also is made up of tiny little tubules that are transparent, fluid-filled, and conduct light. How did we discover that? Well, we stopped studying cadavers. All we knew about the connective tissue prior to about 11 years ago was what we saw when we opened up people who had passed away. And in the first stages, when it's gooey, it just looks like brown, slimy stuff. But as it gets older and it gets more dried out, it becomes like cotton candy and brittle and crackly. And with that view of the fascia, we could easily dismiss it and just say, yeah, it is packing material and it's the stuff in the way when we're trying to get to muscle and organ. However, this magnificent French doctor who was a hand specialist got permission from his patients to use his fiber optic surgical tools to explore and videotape 
inside their body prior to surgery. And when he magnified the fascia by 25 times, he saw this beautiful gossamer web with these little tubules that he made a movie out of called Strolling Under the Skin. And when myofascial release therapists saw this, they were very pleased to know that what they had intuitively imagined the fascia was like was exactly that, these little fiber optics inside your body that tell you where your body is in space through this transmission of information much faster than any nerve impulse can travel. So what implication that has for your overall health in the long term is simpler than imagining you are just single pieces that are unrelated and that uh, you could go in and take a piece out of you and the body would never miss it or react to it. What we see in our practice is somebody who's had a C-section 20 years ago having pelvic pain, trouble with elimination and digestion, that doctors would never credit the surgery for creating. But we now know that when the fascia is interrupted, all those little fibers that used to lay down in the same direction as the muscle repair like plaid, back, forth, crisscross, diagonal, and they want to stabilize because your body was not ready to be cut open and the response in the fascia is, okay, we'll be ready from now on. We'll reinforce this area, we'll stabilize, and the little fascial fibers begin to spread under the skin and wrap around structures inside you to stabilize. That can create this squeezing inside your body and a restriction in areas of your body that are distant from where the scar occurred. And when we do therapy, a person is able to completely let go, lay down, relax, and we work really gently with the scar, with traction and compression to interrupt those fibers and that holding pattern that's in there, which the good news is, is made up of collagen and elastin. So it's not an inevitable deteriorating effect. The collagen can melt, the elastin can stretch, and with sustained traction, those little fibers can start to separate from each other and lay down and spread out, alleviating that internal pressure. If those patterns are left uninterrupted, they can ossify and harden and get so thick that they turn to bone. That's also interesting, and I'm kind of wondering, how long has something like this been, I guess, in us? Is this a new discovery, or has it been around for a while? It is how a human being is put together. So since human beings have existed, it's been there. But if you've ever heard a doctor say, we can't see soft tissue injury with an X-ray or an MRI, you could understand that if these little tubules are made of light and you're trying to shine light into the body, that that's not going to reflect. So we were not able to look inside a living person and see what was going on with the connective tissue until we had these fiber optic surgical tools that one particular French surgeon decided to use to look around in there at the fascia. So it is a recent discovery, and I think it has the potential to completely shift a whole paradigm about how we view our body. Sometimes I feel that we are at a point in time with this discovery, just like when Columbus was being given permission from the Queen of Spain to take three ships out over the ocean to find out if the world was round or flat. But 
myself and my colleagues have been in little rowboats far beyond the horizon for years, and we know that the world is round. We've been working with people's connective tissue, and we understand that when they come in with holding patterns in their body and restriction and pain, they've often tried everything there is to try and not been able to alleviate the pain. When we work with them in this gentle manner, they uh, have such profound shift in their patterns of pain that they look radiant. If you've ever described someone as radiant or glowing, we now know we can account for that phenomenon in a very real way. All of the tiny little fibers inside you have spread out. The light can flow more easily, and you're able to emanate light. You know, it's interesting how we always hear we're beings of light, but a lot of times I think people just kind of think that's more of a metaphor. But in this, it seems physiologically that that's exactly what we are. Isn't that something enough to give you goosebumps? <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> yeah. That's how I feel about it, too. I, when I was first exposed to this material, I was jumping up and down and saying, we can create a bridge now between those of us who talk in terms of energy and vibration with the scientific community that's so used to rolling their eyeballs at us when we say things like we are beings of light. And we can say, look, see, here, this is how. And I have created this tiny little video. It's a minute and 20 seconds. And all I did was take the French doctor's video and I uh, did clips of it and pieced it together so that when my clients came in, I could show them this mechanism in their body and they could better understand while they were on the table and visualize the material that we were working with and understand why we would traction for so long and compress for so long and pull and push in these really slow, gentle ways. And they loved this video so much, they said, really, you should put that on YouTube. So I did. And lo and behold, it just caught on like wildfire. It got, it's probably at over 100,000 views now because practitioners want to use it when they are seeing a client for the first time. And teachers who are wanting their students to learn about this fascial system are using it to teach their students. And I'm so happy that I get to be a voice for this message out into the world. And it's the primary reason why I wrote the book and why I'm talking with you now, so that more of us can understand our body in a simpler way and so that the medical community, in the effort to first do no harm, would recommend this treatment long before they would recommend pain medication or surgery. Now, it's interesting as I'm looking at your website here is that uh, it seems that uh, what I would believe is people get this treatment in lieu of other treatments when it comes to <clears throat> managing or improving uh, the symptoms of pain. Uh, basically, stress all the way around, as we well know now, more than 90% you know, of our diseases and sicknesses are caused because the body is in a stressful state that never can seem to get out of it, perhaps no matter what somebody tries to do. And this is a way that you can help people alleviate that. For our listeners, share what the experience is like when they see what would be known as an MFR practitioner. Okay, that is a great lead-in for me to talk about fascia and stress and what it's like to get a treatment. When you arrive in our offices, what we do seems so simple that the results you get don't make sense. (laughs) 
because we are used to taking our body to a doctor and saying, do something with this. I know you know me better than I do. And doctors have that belief, too. Uh, You don't tell me what's going on with you. I'll tell you. And that's just not true. We know ourselves better than anybody because we're living in here. And all that happens is that you lie on the table and without using any oil or lotion, we put our hands on the skin and we shift the skin to see where it stops moving. Ideally, we should all have dog skin that we could lift easily up from the body and shift and move in different directions without any pull happening underneath. But what we find is that the older we get, the more restriction there is, and the more the skin gets pasted down to the surface of everything underneath. And we are straight jacketed from inside. So when I find where that wall of resistance is, I do not push beyond the wall. I push the skin until it stops moving, and then I wait and wait and wait. And I've had people who, in their initial session, ask me, when are you going to (laughs) start? Because it just seems so quiet and so um, uh, non-results oriented. And that's kind of true. We don't want to have an idea in our head of how you are supposed to react or how long it should take for your body to let go. But with my hands in that position and your skin pushed to its limit, your body first responds the way that it does to most everything, which is with resistance and protection. But if I hang out there long enough, the body really gets the message that it's not being attacked, and then there starts to be this slow easing, melting feeling under my hand and the body can then surrender, interrupt the holding pattern, soften and let go as the fascial fibers begin to separate from each other. And what we are taught is to treat the symptom and look elsewhere for the cause. Because when you were seven years old, say you broke your left ankle, The result of that is that you put more weight on the right foot for a certain period of time. After it healed, you notice that your hips were shifted toward the right a little bit from that change in your alignment while you were healing from the broken foot. And over time, your ribs shift with your hips, your shoulders tip toward the left, and the right shoulder is raised or shifted downward. And that affects your jaw and how you're chewing. So somebody may come to me with TMJ syndrome and say it's on the right side and it's really bothering me. And as I begin to do myofascial release on the jaw and it lets go, they can feel a shift in their shoulders and then a shift in their hips. And so I move to the shoulder, I move to the hip. And as I'm working with the hips, that's when they may say, Oh, I forgot. I broke my ankle when I was seven. Why am I even thinking about that right now? And I'll explain why. Because the protective mechanism of the fascia serves the purpose of squeezing when you get scared. So if you hear a loud noise, you clench. The the biological reason for that is in the fight or flight mode, If you do have to battle something and you get cut, the squeezing in your body prevents you from bleeding excessively. It also squeezes your nerves so that when you are in battle, you don't feel it right away. And many of us have had an experience of being in a car accident, saying at the moment, oh, I'm fine, I don't feel a thing. And then in the days and weeks and months afterwards, having tremendous symptoms of pain in the body that cannot be seen on an x-ray. And a doctor will tell you, well, I didn't find anything. and It might be in your head. 
It is because the soft tissue clamped down in that moment of fear and it never stopped. It wants to protect you. It wasn't ready for that sudden fear and so it clenches and doesn't stop clenching. It isn't meant to be a permanent reaction. It's meant to be temporary. But as you said, people have tried so many things to alleviate stress and nothing has worked. With an understanding of fascia, you can interrupt that holding pattern. Let me give you an example. I like to talk about uh, caveman versus modern man. So he's walking along, caveman, and comes around a boulder and, ah, there's a wild animal. He gets a huge shot of adrenaline right to his psoas muscle, right in the center of his body. The purpose of the psoas is to lift your leg for fight or flight. And he does. He obeys that adrenaline. He fights the beast and he runs to safety. And in doing so, his body metabolizes away all of that adrenaline and the byproduct of muscular use, lactic acid, uric acid. And he pees it away because his body moved and it squeezed and it metabolized out that fear chemistry. Now, modern man is driving. He's riding along and comes around the corner. Boom, somebody pulls out in front of him. He gets the same amount of adrenaline caveman used to get. Shot right to the psoas. But he knows that if he were to react physically in a wild manner, that he'd put himself and everyone else in danger. So he has to tell his body... Not now. And the mechanism of not now is the fascia. It clamps down and holds that adrenaline against the surface of the muscle. And the only movement that he can allow himself is from the accelerator to the brake. Then he has a half an hour to drive home. By the time he gets there, he has either forgotten about it completely or he processes it intellectually, saying, Oh, some guy pulled out in front of me, nearly killed us all, scared me to death. But his body never had a chance to tell the truth about how it felt in that moment. So he may go on about his life with that frozen response inside his body and that chemistry of fear marinating between the saran wrap layer of fascia and muscle. If he knew that we, most of us, suffer from severe lack of temper tantrum, he would know that it would be safe to go privately into his room, close the door, lay on the bed, kick his heels and pound his fists and yell into a pillow to allow the body to physically, biologically process that chemistry and disturb the holding pattern, open things up so that the parasympathetic nervous system can kick in for rest and restore. And when that happens, you get a release of endorphin, dopamine, and oxytocin, which is the chemistry of love. And after a a SNIT fitness program like that, you rest. Oftentimes you could have a nap like a two-year-old after a temper tantrum and you have just done a huge service to your physical body by emptying your storage tank of all of that freeze response and the holding patterns that come from fear. It's just it's also interesting when you consider what you're talking about here because a lot of times people will hold experiences in their body and you know with even for instance the science and I know you talk briefly about Dr. Bruce Lippin's work in the biology of belief and how we hold yes. cellular memories and to you know when you sometimes have these mysterious pains that come on and you can't seem to put your finger on why they have occurred because you physiologically haven't experienced any particular kind of trauma but it may be an old memory from a trauma that you may have had, perhaps being fired from a job or being, you know, expelled from school, whatever the case may be. And so you hold that in without really 
working with your body to release it, you can see how down the road this can eventually create pain because you're really holding, you know, a negative energy, memory, if you will, you know, in the body. And this is a way that you can release that and therefore releasing pain. So it's really getting to the root cause of things, it sounds like. Yes. I have a wonderful analogy, again, about citrus, (laughs) that can help me explain that... uh, a thought in your mind can create a chemical response in your body. So imagine with me, if you will, that you're visiting me here in Ojai, California, and we go for a walk in one of the many orchards that are around here. And say it's a lemon orchard, and it smells intoxicating. What you ask is, can I pick one of these? And I say, oh, sure, yeah, they won't mind. So you grab a lemon off the tree and dig your fingernail into the skin of the lemon and you can see the zest fly up and the sunshine and it smells delicious and you forget that you did that and later you lick your thumb and realize, whoa, that is really sour and you get that super sour taste of the lemon. So anyone listening to this right now is probably salivating and there is no lemon here. But by creating the visual and bringing up the memory and uh, eliciting your thoughts about a lemon, your body responds with salivation. So whatever it is that you dwell on, even if it's a perceived danger and nothing really threatening in your physical environment, your body still responds as though it's happening. And that can explain very simply why thoughts create chemical reactions in your body. And I love these analogies because um, it really helps people who are skeptical get it in a real way. But what I'm talking about doesn't have to be proven yet. It's already known. And one of my uh, other favorite things to say is I don't have to convince anybody about how fiber optics transmit light and information because we all watch cable. And those messages and images are brought into our homes through tiny translucent glass tubes. Fiber optics carry information. This is just so incredible, I think, for our listeners out there. I'm sure they're going to kind of sit and chew on this for a bit. But, you know, the truth is, is you can see the reality of how all this just makes sense. And most importantly, I get the sense that this is a treatment, especially as you describe in your book, uh, the light uh, is that, uh, or excuse me, touching the light, is that uh, people begin to understand and experience their bodies. They begin Mm -hmm. to... To, to have that wisdom that the body actually has, especially when it comes to healing, and not feel so separate from it like we tend to feel. Absolutely. We grow up with a perspective that our brain is the master and the body is the slave. And it really helps for us to partner with our body, to stop regarding it as some misbehaving slave that needs to be punished. We want to bring the two of you back into relationship because when we're young, we're being taught to please sit down, please hold still, please be quiet. And we can't always be thinking about that in order to be socially appropriate. So that goes on a background program like an operating system on a computer. And it's always running things, and it's in charge of keeping you appropriate. And when you're young, you can find that you're holding in your throat so you don't talk too loud. Speaking of my throat, I've got a tickle. Excuse me. And you are holding in your arms so that you don't slap people and reach out and take other kids' toys. And you're holding in your legs so that you don't hit people. And you can disperse that holding when you're young by jumping around and acting goofy and moving a lot. But the older you get and the more dignified you are, 
And the more appropriately you behave, the less likely you are to allow your body to spaz out and move in goofy, undignified ways. In the town where I live, there are a lot of yoga classes and meditation practices and focus on spiritual evolution with the mistaken belief that if you do that enough, one day you'll get to the point where nothing upsets you. And that's just not true because we have this special system inside which reacts to fear. If you hear a loud noise, your whole body is clenching inside. It is for the purpose of survival. Trying to pretend that you're not upset causes you to not allow yourself to feel. You, as a man, know what it's been like to grow up and learn to suck it up, be a man, uh, big boys don't cry. All of that is important to know for you to get along with your village. But you must also know that there are times to go somewhere privately and give your storage tank body a chance to let go of that chemistry. Because if you think that not letting yourself feel makes it go away, it doesn't. It stores it in your body for later. And without understanding that, you can end up at 50 or beyond with a body full of not just memories and experiences, but physical holdings in your fascia where the chemistry of that moment is trapped. And what's interesting is that when a person is receiving myofascial release, and I'm saying, just let go, there's no agenda here, it's okay to soften, nothing bad will happen if you let go, and they do, and that fascia shifts and unclenches, the blood gets between the layer of fascia and muscle and carries away the lactic acid, adrenaline, and uric acid that has gotten gummy and crystallized and has caused the fascia to adhere to the muscles so that you can't move as easily. And when the blood carries that away, that's great. But now it's in your bloodstream. And folks experience fear, anxiety, sadness, grief, usually the the stuff we try to hide, because... It's flowing through their bloodstream and it can cause people to wonder if they're going crazy for feeling angry when they're on the table. And if I can tell them ahead of time, this is the mechanism that's happening, that your body is actually leaking out this old chemistry, then they can calm down to know that they're not going crazy. They're actually going sane as the chemistry moves into their kidneys and they can metabolize it out. Interesting, interesting. You know, for our listeners out there, Renell, is there a website people can discover more about how they can find out where perhaps a practitioner is or how they can, you know, discover what the service might be able to do for them? Yes. That's the number one thing on everyone's mind. Now, okay, where do I go? How do I get this What does it cost and how long will it take? My first wish for the people who are listening is buy the book. My book, Touching Light, is available on Amazon. Once you have read that, it takes care of your skepticism about this. If you find a practitioner and you have that information under your belt, your sessions will be You will get so far in the first session past all the things that I'm used to having to explain to people in their first, second, or third visit. You'll already know that. You'll hop on board and you'll say, okay, take me. Let's go. (laughs) And the way to find a practitioner, the best way I know, is to go to the website of my mentor, John Barnes has a website that's called myofascialrelease.com. In there, there is a therapist locator. You plug in your zip code, 
and it will show you if there is a practitioner in your area. On our website, omsanctuary.com, that's O-H-M as in mom, sanctuary, stands for Ojai Healing Movement Sanctuary, dot com. You can learn more about fascia. You can view the fascia video that I described. And if you ever want to come visit us, we would love to set up a series of treatments for you. It's a wonderful resort town. And I have plans to travel to different cities and hold workshops where I teach not only what fascia is, but we show you how to do self-myofascial release and how to correct the things you were doing that got you in that condition by teaching classes that really instruct people about uh, the most important thing is to walk with your feet straight so that your feet are pointed in the same direction that you're walking. Many of us walk with our feet turned out and that twists the ankles, knees, and hips in a direction that doesn't support healthy connective tissue. So there are many ways in which a person can avail themselves of the information and this treatment. Well, very good. Rennell, I want to thank you for taking the time to join us here on the program today. And for our listeners out there, the book is Touching Light, How to Free Your Fiber Optic Fascia. And Rennell, again, thank you for joining us here on the program today. Thank you so much. This was fun. You betcha. We want to thank you, the listeners out there, for joining us every day. You can also discover more at our website, beyond50radio.com. That is the number 50. We encourage you to subscribe to our weekly e-newsletter. Find out what's going on in the Beyond 50 community. You can also follow us on Twitter at Beyond 50 Radio as well as Facebook. I'm Daniel Davis. Thank you for joining us. This is the Beyond 50 Radio program. And remember, live your day past halfway. Thank you.